we're involved now with talking about chapter 20, and uh, this is on safety, and uh, it's a chapter that may not seem as important as other chapters, but I believe in the overall scheme of things that it is probably as pivotal, pivotal a chapter as you're going to have, because I think in most situ situations, you're going to start, or in real world, you're going to start with thinking of safety first and then work away from that in other directions. But instead of being an afterthought, it should be the primary uh, design criteria that you start with. Unfortunately, we don't have enough safety PLCs and they're more expensive so that they're not going to be easily available. But you can, uh, in the lab that we have, you can uh, do the lab that we have for the safety and get credit for it and get the ideas that, that are here. Uh, otherwise, if you're remote, you will just have to read through these and, and then uh, as you're buying processors, uh, I'm trying to encourage you to think in terms of buying safety processors and then if you need it, you got it. And if you don't need it, well, there's no harm, no foul. But if you do need it, then you have to go back and prod it in as opposed to just, well, here it is, we can just use it with the rest of what we've got. So think of it as really two processors in one. There is the regular processor, and then there's a safety on top of that. If you need it, you've got it, and it's it's always gonna be there. With that in hand, I just wanna to talk to you a little bit about what we're talking about, which is uh, fail safe or uh, fault tolerant design, which is not fail safe, which is, uh, which has to do with what we call triple, triple modular redundancy. If you were going to send somebody to the moon, you'd want to be able to have a uh, system that had more than two, preferably three uh, processors, and there would be a vote between the three. If three out of the three agree that this is what we're gonna do, you do it. If two out of the three agree, then you still do it, but you are in the process of trying to fix the third one. So that gives you this idea that you can always survive. Well, in fault tolerant systems, you say, I'm just gonna go back to a safe condition. I can stop, I don't have to continue on. I'm not in a situation where I'm gonna lose my life or anything like that. I just wanna stop in a safe position. That's what we're talking about. That would be something that you would use in a factory. So we're talking about two systems instead of three. And uh, that is, uh, primarily all we're, we're going to concentrate on. Um, so the, the Germans have done a, a good job of uh, defining various processes and uh, how to treat them as far as applying safety. Um, BGIA was the term that they used at one time. Now that term has been IFA, but if you were to Google either of these two terms, you would find the uh, German uh, social accident insurance uh, uh, websites, and they would tell you how to apply uh, to certain applications for a factory, how to apply a safety in order to make sure that it goes to a safe condition. Um, the uh, These are called part of the machinery directive, and uh, therefore that you want to be able to make sure that you are as safe as possible. So now a risk is defined as, um, it's a two parts, the severity and the probability. So it's the two together. So it's the severity of a possible something happened wrong and the probability that that's going to happen. And you should go through this analysis if you have a project and ask the questions at various points, what would it take to make something safe? And if you haven't got to that point, then you're going back and continue to go back until you get make it safe as possible. You're never going to make 100% safety, but just as safe as possible. Um, so I have seen this movement into safety over the last 25 years. And um, I had a project with a fellow that we would design uh, a uh, pneumatic press that came down 
and uh, for a car hood. And he always had two buttons that were far enough apart that you couldn't push them with one arm. You had to in initiate them with two, 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 two hands. And uh, for a while, I would write the program so that you could do that in the PLC. Then he had a uh, different uh, piece of equipment that if you hit these together, it would turn on an output, and that was allowing the, uh, the operation of the, of, the, of the press. So that was a safety um, relay. And this would be a picture of a safety relay like that. And I've used Schneider because Schneider is the French equivalent of Siemens. And we've talked a lot about Alan Bradley, and we've talked a lot about Siemens in this course. Well, here is a competitor of theirs. That's Schneider. And there is a description of that relay, what it does. Okay. Um, in the United States, OSHA is the uh, group that talks about safety. And uh, in, in the United States, uh, the employer is responsible. And a lot of it has to do with NFPA 79. So you can look up those um, National Fire Protection uh, Article 79. So here is a listing of the various uh, categories. And uh, in Europe, they talk about SILs. And in the United States, they talk about categories. And category three and four require safety equipment two and one and category b do not so the equivalent of, of category three is sill two and category four is sill three and there's also in europe there's a sill four so here's a line and then below that line sill two or category three you must use safety equipment it's an important graph because it shows you the era that we are in. So before 2003, in the United States, you could not use a um, PLC for safety related uh, logic uh, for, a, for a punch press or other things that have, had, had traditionally been using only just relays. You couldn't use a, a safe a, a PLC for it. After 2003, that rule was taken down and you can use program controllers or if they're rated for the application, they can be used for safety related issues. Okay. And um, here's some of the manuals that go along with that. And here is a picture that you should have in your head of a double linked chain that if any one link breaks, that you're not going to fail. You're going to go back to a safe state, but you're not going to fail. So basically, at every state, at every step, there's two. There's two things checking each other or monitoring each other to make sure that it doesn't fail. So there's no weak link. There's no one link. There's only double links in this chain. And that's what we have in this process. Here's some of the processors, and you notice that they have yellow if they're Siemens and red if they're Allen Bradley. So you can look at a processor and you can tell if it's safety or not. So here's a, a video of an area for videos from Siemens, but I want to go through this with you. This is a, um, what can happen? So Kansas City Power and Light uh, won a $135 million judgment from the Rockwell or the Allen Bradley Corporation due to an explosion that occurred based on the fact that somebody went in and changed some logic in the PLC. And that caused this explosion. Or to, it allowed it to happen. It didn't cause it, but it allowed it to happen. So, obviously, this was a big blow. And uh, you really don't want this kind of thing to happen. 
and it says it was an, an errant Allen Bradley guidebook for installing switching equipment that malfunctioned and opened the gas line, which caused the explosion. And Allen Bradley contended a short circuit with the sewer water caused the malfunction. And whatever it was, um, it didn't kill anybody, but it caused a lot of damage. And uh, jurors placed 100, or 621 million of damage uh, on the uh, total. And out of that 621 million, 130.6 million was blamed on the program controller. So we don't want that to happen. That's problematic. It didn't kill anybody in this case, but it could have. It was a big boom. It talks a little bit about it, what happened. And, um, anyway. So that's a pretty big incentive for applying uh, safety equipment as needed. And here is a, uh, from that same, we've talked a little bit more of, of, from the 2018 uh, version 14 of the software, the TIA software, and later this is where this was introduced. And uh, just a little bit of, uh, from that manual about safety PLCs from Siemens. And it goes through some of the um, descriptions. So a safety PLC is not totally a safe PLC. There's two parts to this PLC. One is the regular and one is the safe part. And they have to transfer information back and forth, which has to be guarded, obviously, so that the safe part is not corrupted. But that's being said, you have to be able to communicate between the two. And uh, this is called an F runtime group. That would be a safety group. And here's how you create it. And uh, the idea of a signature, uh, once you've created this program, you kind of padlock it with a, uh, you, you basically have a, uh, a way of keeping the information so that uh, there's a password protection and um, you only hold that password yourself and if at some point in time you want to give that information over to somebody else then they're responsible for making the changes to the to the safety part of the plc if they want to if they want to allow that to be done not the person who owns that password is the one that is in ownership of the safety part of that plc and responsible that. So there's a, a, a process for doing this, and uh, that's not necessarily software, that's just how, how that is done. And also uh, this idea of signatures, when people do various things. Uh, so in our lab, we do not have a uh, we have one program that we, we can run and the program is a given and after the program is installed then the responsibility is to wire it and that's all you have to do that's the only condition that you have is to, to wire the processor and see it work but you have to use the wiring as it's described or it won't work uh, one of the inputs is a category four input and it Category 4 means that you provide the power from the processor as opposed to just a straight 24 volt um, supply. So you're, you're looking at the power from the processor and that power has a uh, signature uh, pulse to it so that ever so often that pulse is turned off and then back on again. And the inputs are, that are watching that input are watching for that pulse and if they don't see it, they don't. They, they, they turn off the process. So in other words, they shut you down if you don't see that process. So if you want to be able to have those inputs, those category four, those more stringent inputs work, you have to wire them to that 
output that has that 24 volts in it, but it also has that pulse, that signature pulse in it. So that's the extra guarding of that. Not, it's not a straight power supply, it's just a power supply, but with a pulse. So this is um, some more of this uh, uh, values of the, uh, of the uh, that manual that we added to the uh, chapter that basically just pasted it in and uh, gives you some additional information about what's in there now. Why is data types important? There is a restriction on the types of data that you can transmit because, again, you're transmitting from a safe area to a non-safe area, and it has to be um, it has to be the types that there's only certain types that they allow. Um, Here is some of these examples, uh, a static variable. So again, uh, the, uh, the chapter is a starting point. It's not the ending point for you to use safety. It gives you some ideas, and then the, the project at the end, if you're in the lab here uh, at the university, you can wire that uh, and see it work. And that gets you started down this road of being able to, to code um, safety programs um, using uh, passing data back and forth between the two. Um, it's done in that program. Uh, being able to watch the program run live is there, and you can watch it as well. But if you can wire it, you can get well on your way to being able to understand how um, it works. Now, the use of timers and uh, uh, some of the other instructions, you say, why would that be? Well, because Siemens uses a Kind of a different way of, of solving the, the program. Uh, both Allen Bradley and Siemens use like two input points to monitor for inputs and two output points to monitor for outputs. So if an output turns on, you turn on both outputs and then you watch the output and if the output turns on, then you're, you're, you're okay, otherwise the output turns off. So everything is doubled. But with the program, how do you double the program? Well, Allen Bradley has two different processors, to my understanding, that they have two different processors that they run. And they run separately, and then they, get a, they have to get the same answer. Siemens runs a De Morgan type concept where they run the same processor, but they run the program twice. They run it once positive and once negative. Uh, with logic, you can do that because all you have to do is apply the De Morgan rule. But with timers, how do you do that? And they have to do some special accommodations for things like timers and counters that are a little bit different because how do you take the De Morgan of a timer or counter? Well, anyway, uh, that's why they're, that they only allow certain types. You have to be careful about what you, what you use, okay? So here describes the data exchange between the standard program and the F program. And the rules for that. Again, I'm not going to get into this except, except that here, here's some of the definitions. There is a data buffer and um, data to safety, data from safety, and then you have to pass that information through that data buffer. I don't know the rationale for it, but that's what you have to do. And again, testing the program and stopping the program. You'll get this plenty of times when you're wiring until you get the program wired exactly right, and it will not run. So it's very difficult to get this program to run. But again, the, the first process we thought would be to wire it and then go from there. That's why that's been our, our, our goal. Okay, so how does a group of this subject grasp this subject in a week or two? That's a tough question. So it is 
very highly desired, however, to have students to have some practical experience in the area of safety. In order to accomplish this, we decided to give a sample program. So uh, this was a sample program that a student actually got running. I found the program, um, got it up to a point, but then he fixed it and he got it running and uh, gave me the wiring diagram for it. And I put it on the website. If you can use that wiring diagram to get the program to work, to run, to turn on an output, uh, you've succeeded. Now, that program is uh, not exactly the same as the program in the uh, appendix of this chapter, but it's close. Uh, that appendix used remote I.O. and we use all static I.O. on the processor. This is a picture of the, um, of the um, safety PLC that we have. And you notice that there are these two contactors here and I highly recommend that you do not use these two contactors but that you use the little 24 volt relays instead. They wire the same, but you can put 22 gauge wire into those contacts where these do not use, these will not use 22 gauge wire. They will only use 18 or higher gauge, 18 or 16 or 12 or 14 or 12 gauge wire. So please, uh, while these are nice, don't use them. Use the, the relays that we use in chapter two and they wire the same, but they're much easier to get to work than these are. So you may take these and slide them off to the side or whatever, but put these little, little relays down here on the corner and use them instead of these. This is the uh, remote stop. Uh, this is the, the one emergency stop. And um, I think this is the one that uses the, um, the, the category four uh, signal. This is the one that has that pulsed 24 volt input. Here, is a standard uh, push button station, but you must get a separate, a se uh, another um, push button for that. Uh, you must use another selector switch, I believe it is, for that as well. So you use these plus another selector switch. You have to add that selector switch. So you look around and find a selector switch that will fit in this other hole if you don't find one already. These are the relays that I was talking about. Please use these. And um, this idea of one of one or one of two evaluations, so they're, they're read twice by the same input. This is your, this is your uh, fail-safe I.O., so one of two evaluation. And uh, the guy that did this was Austin Rhodes. He was the one who first came up with this and made it work, and I salute him, and we have gone forward from there. So this is a working version of this program. This used these two relays, but please use the smaller relays instead. But uh, this is a picture of that working. It's a picture of the uh, wiring diagrams. So these names out here are the um, wires that you'll find someplace else that are referenced someplace else. And um, you can track them down. And you, it's, a, it's a crossword puzzle, it basically boils down to, and uh, it works. It's been tried enough times. This, this is actually a working model. It works well. And this is the program that you see. And this would be one of the program that you would load and see on the uh, screen. Again, if you're doing this remotely, you can just look at these pages and get an idea. And uh, at some point in time, if you're ever asked to, to start writing a program, you can look at these as a, as a starting point. Um, there's plenty of reference material as well. And the material that I reference in this chapter is, is very useful for, for doing that as well. But uh, if you can see it, it makes it a little bit easier for down the road for you to at least be a little bit more comfortable about saying that you can do something like this. Um, having an existing program always helps you to design future programs. And also, 
uh, the idea that you start from a safety POC and then work your way back. If you need it, you got it. Uh, if you need it for communication, this is not only good for safety within this PLC, but you can also use it for communication to other devices. And uh, if you have a safety PLC in your system, you can use it to, uh, if the communication goes down, shut something down. It's a very, very powerful way of, uh, of controlling a system is to at least have one of the PLCs in your system being a safety PLC, being able to guard against the possibility of something going wrong. So yes, you can have safety in your, in your communication, your ethernet communication between different processors. Yes, that's doable. I've not done it yet, but it is doable. So hopefully this gives you some ideas as to how to set up a safe PLC. Um, not that I'm an expert at it. I have not done one of these in the field yet. I just have used this one and we have this lab with it. And it is something that you can say, at least I've done one. And uh, that gives you a, the confidence, hopefully, that you can use it for, for down the road in the future. This appendix down here is um, the uh, original uh, program that was given to us from the vendor that had to do with the, um, this is a presentation that we captured from that, uh, when, we, when we bought these processors, this 1215F, and this was a presentation that built that program that we had above. But again, this presentation is built on having some remote I.O as opposed to having it all local I.O. And there is a difference between the two. So I want you to understand that they're not exact. The program that we have, the I.O. that we have is all local I.O. And this refers to some of it as remote I.O. So that is a difference between what we have and this. But the steps are the same. 